So hello everybody, my name is uh, Klomenis Katevas. I am a machine learning researcher at uh, Brave. And today I'm going to talk about uh, practical privacy preserving federated learning and uh, what we're exploring at Brave. Uh, some introduction. Uh, as I said, I'm an ML researcher um, and my research interests are privacy preserving machine learning, mobile systems, uh, mobile sensing, crowd sensing, and a little bit of, of human computer interaction. So what is Brave uh, for people that are not familiar? Uh, we offer a privacy alternative to big tech uh, in several products like uh, most popular is the web browser, uh, firewall and VPN, shared uh, talk, rewards, news, wallet, uh, integrated wallet with the Brave and the playlist. Why users uh, browse using Brave? Uh, one of the main reasons is it's very, very fast. It loads eight times faster uh, than uh, mobile, you know, two times faster uh, from on the, on the desktop. Uh, it empowers users to opt in to advertising, uh, and in a, in it, they can also get some rewards. Uh, security is another main reason, because it stores malware and uh, ransomware, and uh, saves users significant data and charges in our time. Uh, also, it is a privacy by default uh, through Brave Seals on every website uh, that you visit. And uh, it's also embedded within what we call Brave Core. So that makes it very fast, um, uh, extremely fast actually, because it doesn't use external plugins and extensions. I'm part of the machine learning team at Brave together with uh, Moritz and Lorenzo sitting over there. Uh, and uh, the Mel, uh, products, the mail um, uh, areas that we focus is uh, ad targeting, news recommendation, anti-fraud, uh, search query embeddings, and uh, web compatibility prediction. And saying that, I uh, just want to say to everybody that we are also hiring uh, um, an, um, a senior mail engineer and also um, student internships for three months. So please contact us in case you are interested. As you realize, uh, doing machine learning without accessing the user's data is quite hard, uh, if not impossible. Uh, so it's obvious that federated learning is uh, uh, it's, it's very important for us. Um, so the, the aim of uh, the, the bravest approach for federated learning is uh, to enable learning from user's data in the privacy perspective fashion, to improve prediction performance and drive engagement in advertisement, news, et cetera. And everything is happening. I mean, I don't need to introduce federated learning to everybody. Uh, until now, you should be familiar with federated learning, right? Uh, but the main and most important thing is that all of the training is happening on device within uh, potentially uh, in the web browser, as I will talk in a few minutes. Uh, we have several privacy protection mechanisms. Even on low sensitive data, and these are the data that I will explain in a bit. And but, however, in this figure you will see how we envision uh, our federated learning uh, platform that we will uh, release in the future. Uh, every client can have uh, their, their their device. It can be a mobile device. It can be uh, their desktop computer that they train the model locally. They contribute the model to an Centralized service. Um, it also comes through a proxy service, which, uh, because we have end to end encryption, this proxy service doesn't have any access to the actual data or, in the case of federated learning, the model weights, the model parameters. However, this proxy service can remove some sensitive information that we can identify the users, like the IP addresses. As a very first um, uh, use case for federated learning, uh, what we are uh, exploring is uh, advertising, advertisement timing. And this is the project of Andreas Harris over there and uh, collaboration with uh, many people. Uh, it's a collaboration between Flower, University of Cambridge and Brave. And um, what I didn't mention before is that Brave, even though it removes every um, uh, it doesn't show advertisements or removes all of the ads from the websites. Users can opt in to receive some advertisements, and what they get is a reward of a crypto um, in bad crypto is what Brave has, 
Uh, and these advertisements are simply notifications, okay? Uh, you can receive some notifications and then you can get some cryptocurrency. In this project, what we want to do is we want to minimize the user disruption and hence improve the user experience. And at the same time, maximize the user's engagement within the ads. So imagine if right now I receive a notification, most probably I will just dismiss it or I, mean, I won't even touch it, right? However, if we could detect what is the optimal moment that the user could engage with the notification, this is the win. And we want to do that without accessing any of the user's data in a centralized fashion. Uh, to motivate this further, uh, um, as I said, since we don't have access to the data, it's, it's quite hard with people that work with ML, they can, they can realize, right? Um, uh, investigating what type of features you want to extract is quite hard if you don't have the centralized data to experiment with different type of features. Uh, so what we did is, first of all, we uh, used experience from past projects, and this is an example with some past works we participated. And in this example, we tried to do um, just predict engagement with push notifications on mobile devices to, with, from features of all of these, uh, let's call them sensors from a mobile device. You can realize how sensitive these type of data are. So we don't want to do that in a centralized fashion. Like we even access, uh, I mean, semantic location, this accesses your GPS. And this is the logistic regression based model, uh, which asks, is this a good time to show an advertisement to the user through a series of, um, of features like time features, user activity features, and uh, ad engagement features. And this is a binary thing. If it's true, then we predict that this is the right moment. If not, this is not the user we expect not to engage, not to click on the notification, or not to engage at all, like uh, the notification will expire. Some features um, that we designed uh, are time-based features, like time of the day, date of the day of the week. It is represented as angular distance. Uh, 24 user activity features uh, in categories of like number of uh, unique websites you have visited, time since the last link that you have clicked, uh, etc. And also um, features connected with ad advertisement engagement. For instance, if I know that in the last notification uh, has been sent, the user has engaged with. So basically, if I just click the notification, most probably this can be a good predictor that in the next, I don't know, whenever the next notification comes in, I might engage again. So basically, we use the ground truth label of the past notification. These are the results with uh, synthetic data. Uh, at this stage, we haven't uh, really used, um, we haven't distributed this system. I'll talk a bit briefly a bit more about that uh, later. So for that reason, uh, Andrea used synthetic data and this is an IID data uh, or versus non-IID that you can see the results over there uh, with different uh, alpha and beta um, parameters, which shows how close the, 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 the non-IID distributions are. Um, what is next? Uh, at Brave, what we do is uh, we have three builds, the nightly build, the beta build, and uh, what leads into the actual uh, release of uh, Brave. Uh, as a first step, we want to, um, to, to use the nightly build, uh, the whole uh, uh, change request will be migrated next week, sometime next week. So first we want to uh, do a small user site with brave internal staff only, um, then move that into an external user study. We have a good um, forum with users that engage with, like a community uh, with around 150,000 uh, users, and then uh, enable this into the night we build, and then eventually we lead into the main release. But what is missing from the federated learning landscape um, is and I'm moving into a like a slightly different area uh, is some question that we have how we can enable machine learning modeling across different third-party applications maybe even uh, the apps uh, to solve existing or new machine learning problems how we can take advantage of topological network properties 
for instance, uh, 5G antennas, etc., for better FL convergence without compromising the user's privacy, and how we can provide collaborative FL models trust friendly in an as a service fashion. And the answer to all of this is what we call uh, federated learning as a service. And this is a project that I have been uh, working uh, with uh, while I was uh, telephonic research with my uh, ex colleagues, uh, Nicolas and Diego. So, what is FLAS? Um, how we call it? We call it FLAS. Uh, it provides an uh, extensible high level APIs and software developing kits for service users and privacy preserving management. It enables collaborative machine learning training across customers on the same device within APIs uh, in the privacy preserving fashion and enables hierarchical uh, construction and exchange of machine learning models across the network and can inst be instantiated in different types of devices uh, and environments like phone, home devices, uh, like routers, edge nodes, etc. So these are the three use cases that we see. The first use case is the typical federated learning uh, thing. Imagine if you have a mobile phone, and let's talk about um, mobile devices at this stage, where you have a service running, the Flash service, imagine that being an app already installed there. And then a third party uh, company or small company that they don't have the experience, the expertise, the infrastructure to do federated learning. What they can do is they can go and communicate with the Flash service within the app. I'm not talking about centralized again. So exchange either the samples or even train a model locally on their app and then distribute to the Flash service the trained model. And then Flash is responsible for uh, taking care of all the FL, uh, like FL rounds, um, doing the federated averaging on the, on the central server, etc. And this is the first use case. Individual labs for their own machine learning problem. The second use case, which is the most more interesting, is different applications collaborate together to solve the same ML problem. For example, two different apps that collect images, okay? And they have different non-IAD distributions of the same uh, type of samples, Instagram and Facebook. Um, they don't want to share the data together. However, they trust the flat service so that they, they distribute, they send these uh, samples to the flash service. Then the flash service can do the machine learning, the on-device training, and then continue with the whole federated learning. Um, and that's the second use case. Or at the same time, and this is what we call joint samples, right? Two different apps, they can join the samples to the flash service to do the, 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 the modeling, the on-device training. However, we also support what we call joint models. Joint models means that every single app can uh, train the model on their app, within the app, and then only send the trained model to the Flash service. Uh, uh, federated averaging is happening, again, on device as a first uh, level, and then distributes that to the federated learning infrastructure. And the third use case is quite theoretical. We haven't really dug into this yet. Um, it's a more of, uh, of different apps collaborating to solve a, uh, um, a new machine learning problem. For example, uh, different type of companies like Uber and Spotify. Spotify is an expert on knowing uh, music recommendation. Uber can share the mobility data and then jointly try to solve this problem. So what we try to do is we did an actual study uh, with actual users and run um, and tested the first two use cases. Uh, actually, we tested the joint samples and the joint models so, so that uh, different apps can collaborate. And what is quite uh, interesting here is that we know that um, in the mobile ecosystem, it's either Google or Apple that they're doing it, but they control the infrastructure of this. They control the operating system. They can do whatever they want. They might want to train in the background for as many time, as many hours as they want. A third-party developer, which is the actual user here, cannot do that. They need to play the game. They need to follow the rules of uh, these uh, big players. So, and this is what we do. Uh, this is the Flash system architecture and how we manage to, to solve the problem. We have a backend. Uh, 
uh, what we call the Flash server, which has an admin interface. Everything is running in Heroku as a cloud service. And you have an app developer that can log in and then can uh, register the app. Then we have the client device that the Flash Locker is running within. And it can be an app or it can even be, for example, Android is open source. It can even be a service that can run inside the app. And then uh, the apps, one, two, and three are actual apps, third-party apps that can uh, include the Flask, what we call Flask library. Um, periodically, on every 15 minutes, the Flask lo Flas local communicates with the backend server and sends the device status. Like, I'm alive, I can connect to the network, I can, I can run the file tasks, and this is uh, my, my status, my battery, for example, my battery level. Um, then when the flash server, uh, the app developer can create an FL project there and can configure what type of project, how many FL rounds you want to run, uh, what is the data set, um, and what is the end condition of the, when the FL rounds will end eventually. Uh, so when the, 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 when the project is started, we use uh, silent push notifications. These are actual push notifications that the mobile phone can receive and can uh, an app can wake up in the background and can execute something. In our case, this something is we use a scheduler to schedule an FL task that will eventually run. Um, of course, the apps can communicate with the class local. Uh, and unfortunately, this is only supported uh, on Android. Uh, yet iOS doesn't support this. And that's the only reason, that's the only limitation we faced for not um, uh, including uh, iOS users in our study. Moving next, um, for uh, non-device training, we use TensorFlow Lite. We're extremely excited that uh, um, TF Lite is now supporting um, uh, on-device training uh, since uh, three, four months ago. Uh, to, to be fair, at the moment that we did the study, this was not released yet publicly. They only had the demo version that uh, this is the, 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 the code base that we used. So, uh, and um, this figure shows the difference between the Flask local service and how it communicates with any type of application. You can see the Flask nib is included in both. And with some differences, which is as an input, the app is giving inserting the samples. And uh, notice that you can only you only need around uh, ten lines of code to include the flash lib into an app. Basically, the the API is as simple as you include the data, you authenticate with the flash local, and then you get as an output the model that you are uh, willing to train. Uh, you share the local samples or the ML model, depending on the configuration, joint samples or joint models. And uh, Flash Local is responsible for receiving the, the silent push notifications, the packet communication authentication, app authentication, um, uh, sending the periodic device status um, to the backend, etc. For a user study, we recruited uh, approximately 140 Android users for one month. They all installed the Flask local application and three toy apps. We call them red, green, and blue apps. They were very basic. The only thing they had was uh, every app had different um, 150 unique samples from Cypher 10 data set. Uh, and periodically on every 15 minutes, approximately, you will see later about the limitations, uh, sending device status updates. And Flash server was inviting devices to participate into approximately 50 different federated learning projects with different configurations, joint samples versus uh, joint uh, models configuration, um, different uh, ending condition for terminating a round, IID no versus non-IID, etc. Uh, at the same time, we prompted the users three times per day to report their mobility, phone usage, and for performance, uh, sorry, uh, their mobility, status, phone usage, for performance, and battery performance. So Flash uses the Android uh, work manager for executing tasks in the background, and limitations do exist uh, since Android 8, uh, like the limited background behavior, and since 
uh, uh, version uh, nine, they have these so-called uh, app standby buckets. So basically, if you have an application installed that the user never interacts with this application, then it goes into a lower and lower priority of application. And then at the end, the operating system cuts off any network communication, which is not ideal for our situation. So uh, this is one re of the reasons that we ask the users to not only report their status, but also, I mean, at the moment they clicked on this notification, the, the, the application was uh, appeared to the screen, and then it was considered some engagement of the user with the application. Because if the user never interacts with these toy apps that are like dummy applications, right? they don't do anything, and uh, eventually the user will not do not work with them, then it makes no sense to include them into this FL study. And this figure shows, uh, this is a CDF that shows the two different modes, joint subs versus joint, joint models, and how much, what are the minutes uh, until uh, a federated learning task has been completed. And you can see that uh, most of them completed in a few minutes, but you can see some of them uh, even took them 400 minutes to, to, to be executed. And this is a good indication for what we call stranglers, right? That uh, you can uh, terminate around earlier so that you don't have to wait 400 minutes until the federated learning round is completed. Some more results about this uh, flash in the wild. Uh, we had like 95% uh, of uh, registered devices available per day for running ML training tasks. A slight uh, diurnal uh, behavior of users, uh, user devices in their availability. And used to be users appear to be okay with the way the phone is performing during the day, like 90%, 91% reporting no change, 8.5 uh, 8 some change, and 0 0.8 a drastic change in the phone performance. And of course, this is particularly connected, connected to this training task that uh, we presented, which is training uh, with the Cypher 10. Uh, 150 samples of the Cypher 10. You can also uh, see the peak hours from the notifications that we said. This shows the user engagement and how that influenced the execution of FL rounds. And this two figures shows, uh, actually, this is quite interesting because with the red, we saw um, the ID, IID version of the samples and the blue, then on the, okay, on the left side, you can see the joint samples mode and on the right side, the joint models. Now, with uh, the optimal means that all of the users that we have requested to participate in the well round, what if all of them, um, participated in the FL round, okay? So we did that with a simulation. We asked some users, we knew who, which users we asked to, to do the training, and over a simulation, we said, what is the optimal use case? With available, it means which of those users uh, reported that they are available for executing the training task. The joint users are the users that says, when we send the push notification, this, uh, for a, uh, executing a tra uh, uh, FL training task, they said, they replied back and said, I am available and I'm going to execute this FL task. And the replied users are what happened eventually, okay? It, it's what we got from the actual devices because the other three are simulations based on the distributions we got, but uh, the replied users are the actual simulations. And you can see that the results are not much different. We also have this, um, F, um, every FL round can be split. You can have four parts. One, the blue line shows the join round, which is the task that when the user receives a notification can go to the backend and says, I'm joining the round now. Um, downloading the parameters, which is downloading the, the model weights. Then loading the samples and loading the samples is not only loading from the disk, the, the phone's model, but also uh, loading them into the TF Lite uh, model. Okay, and you can see that this was one of the, um, the most consuming tasks. And finally, conducting, conducting the training with the red line uh, over joint samples and joint models uh, configurations. 
Finally, we used the state-of-the-art uh, test bed uh, for people that are familiar with Battery Lab infrastructure, uh, and measured the duration in second, the CPU utilization and the power, power discharge using a hardware monitor. Uh, over three modern Android devices. So what we did there is we disabled all of the restrictions from the Android uh, system. Uh, and whenever we were sending a notification, then every single task was executed immediately. Okay, no restrictions. And we measured what is, uh, we measured that in three different devices uh, and in the three different, like uh, the duration, the second, the CPU utilization, the discharge. And you can see uh, what, what is quite interesting is that the joint models, uh, first of all, um, is faster. Uh, even though it uses more CPU, uh, the discharge is also lower. And the reason is that imagine if three apps are doing the training simultaneously, okay, compared to the joint uh, models that they're sending the, um, the mod the, sending the data to the um, flash service, then the flash service was, was merging the models and then doing one um, on device training with all of the um, samples together. Flash is available uh, under open source, uh, MIT licensed in this uh, website. Um, we have um, the current results are not available yet. The preprint will be available soon. Um, however, we have demoed a preliminary version of the system, but the full system will be demoed in uh, Mobisys uh, in 1st of July. Uh, feel free to just download and play with the code or uh, send us an email if you're interested. To conclude, I just want to say that uh, federated learning is possible for third party applications, even in the strict mobile ecosystem. Limitations do exist, like the app standby is one limitation, background workers at the same time, because you can request the Android system to execute things in the background, but it will only do that opportunistically whenever the rating system thinks that it's better for the user for not wasting the, the battery life of the device. Uh, On-device training is quite early. Uh, it only uses CPU at this stage, uh, but uh, it got released like a few months ago. Eventually, we'll also use uh, GPU or on this um, um, ML-specific uh, chips that exist on modern devices. Uh, in the future, we want to enable FL for advertising timing prediction on a stable release of Brave. Uh, investigate applicability of FL to more tasks like ad serving and news recommendation. And finally, explore more advanced privacy preserving technologies like the use of uh, TEs or homomorphic encryption, uh, especially for secure aggregation reasons, etc., to do federated lending with more sensitive data that will allow us to do FL with more sensitive data. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to ask questions.